Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in, hard, in, in high places. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle for flesh and blood. We wrestle for the souls of men. And as I was standing there during praise and worship, I thought I heard the Spirit of God say something very clear that, that eternity, the Father, will be calling some today. The God of glory will take time today to prick the hearts of men and women today. And He will call. You will hear I believe, according to what the Spirit was saying to me, people in here will hear eternity call them today. And I'm just going to say, and I'm going to pray, listen to what the Holy Spirit would, would speak to your heart today, please. Father, God of glory, grace, and mercy, we lift up everybody that's in the path of, of the storm that's coming, and we ask God to give, please give them great grace. Give them provision and keep them, God, and even cause this tragedy to work out for a great opportunity for revival in the areas that are affected. And God, let your gospel go. Father, pr protect those, again, who are in the wake and the way of the storm and give them great grace. And Father, I ask you, everyone here, all those who are listening and watching and those who are present in the room today, I ask you, Holy Spirit of the living God, draw us to you. Give us ears to hear what you would say to us in Jesus' name. We're going to be talking about diamonds, or the aspect of heaven's treasure. And let me tell you what heaven has for humanity is exponentially more valuable than what we can think or what we can imagine. Paul said, eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. It's incredibly valuable, and we're going to look at that. People value a lot of different things, and a lot of different things have a lot of different values. I think we understand that. The value of an object determines its priority in our lives. So I think it's safe to say that we prioritize the things that we value. You, you would agree. If something is valuable to you, take money for instance. We, we value money so we prioritize the acquisition of money. Hopefully we value our marriages so we, so we prioritize those marriages. God understands the value of things as well. In fact, he probably understands the value of things much better and in much more detail than, than we do. In Matthew 6, 26, we're going to look at a question that, that Jesus asks. And the question that he asks is, is so profound. In fact, the question that Jesus asks here, in another form, God used this question to radically change and transform my life, or at least to begin that process of transformation in my life. And I believe that if you dare answer the question that Christ is about to ask us, that it will affect the value and the priority of every single thing that you know. Everything that we see and experience, I believe that the answering of this question will affect it. And here's the question. Matthew 16, 26 says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? Let's expand that. Let's say the entire universe. All of creation. And loses his own soul. Powerful question. He goes on to say, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, Jesus does four incredible things with these questions, and I want to share them with you and just highlight them for just a minute. Number one, he measures everything that we value in this current world against the value of our individual eternal soul. What does it matter? He values the temporariness of everything that you can get against the weight of eternity. You live a hundred years. You live a thousand years. It's not even a bleep on the radar of eternity. And he takes that and he does a second thing. He repositions by this the eternal over the temporal as the priority. He says, so what? You get everything. You become president. You become he-man, master of the universe. And you lose your soul. You, you're really left with nothing. Then he goes on and he asks the second part of the question. He says, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. What is eternity worth? What is eternity worth to you? What meager thing do you hold now that you're willing to exchange eternity? But I want to look at it from a little different perspective. 
He places the reality of our desperation right before his eyes and as if to say, what if you say, God, I'm willing to give everything. What if your everything is not enough? What if everything that you could do, everything that you could say, everything that you could give was inadequate to redeem your soul for eternity's sake? What if you said, I give everything, but your everything is not enough? That's the case. It's the case. Which brings us to number four. He reveals through these questions the value of the gift that he's given us. He's given us something that is exponentially more valuable than anything in creation. He's given us a gift that is exponentially more valuable and available than anything that we could offer on our behalves. Luke 10, 20 says this, and this is the premise of the series. He said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In this we see the value of heaven. We see the value of our names. And this is kind of tough. Pastor Dan touched on this last week. There is a literal book in heaven that contains the names. Handscribed, handwritten by somebody in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life. And every single person whose name is written in that book has available all of the treasures, the unsearchable riches of God and treasures of heaven granted to them. All in and because of the capacity of Jesus Christ. An incredible book, but it also implies that there are those among us who may not have their names written, who have not received heaven's most valuable gift. And here's what we need to know. Heaven's true treasure is translation through transformation. I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm, I'm going to dissect what this means. But heaven's true treasure is translation through transformation. The idea of translation is to be taken out of one and made a part of another. Listen, listen, it's not the idea of just being taken out of your past. It's the idea of being set into an intended future. It's the idea of being a citizen of one kingdom and that citizenship being revoked, you being removed from that kingdom and the dictates of that kingdom and becoming a part of another kingdom. We see it spelled out for us in an illustration of it in Colossians 1.13. It says, who delivered us out of the power of darkness. But translation didn't stop there. He didn't just deliver us from the power of the enemy. This is the treasure and translated us into the... And listen to this last part because it's important. And translated us, pulled us out and translated us, placed us, set us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Listen, listen, listen. The implication is adoption. Not mere citizenship, but through Christ, sonship. Sons and daughters and therefore heirs to everything that is God's. Oh, what a gift. What a treasure. What an opportunity that God has presented with humanity. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, and this is the interesting part, how is this translation made possible? How, how do I qualify to be taken out of the kingdom of darkness and made a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? It's called transformation. And we witness the reality of this in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has, has been found by faith in and accepted Jesus Christ, he is a new creature. Oh, that's the transformation. See, Christianity isn't, isn't merely the reciting of creeds and, and the memorization of scriptures and oath. It's a personal relationship that is transformative and something amazing happens. I'm going to revisit this in a little bit, in, in much greater depth, in fact, later on in the message. But therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Well, that's great, Pastor Tony, but why is this important? Why is this important? Because I believe that in order to truly value the life that Christ has called us to, we need to understand the death that he has called us from. 
in order to value the translation into the kingdom of God and His righteousness and the kingdom of the Son of His love, we must know where we've been or where we are. And that's clearly defined in Romans 6.23. It says, the payment for sin is death. Okay, so, 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 so the result of sinful behavior. Sin means to miss the mark of God. It means to trespass in conscious rebellion against Almighty God. And the payment for that is death. Now listen. If you've never told a lie and you've never taken anything and you've never looked lustfully upon someone who's not your wife, if you've never committed a sin, I want you to raise your hand. If you raise your hand right now, it's because you don't know what you don't know. Nobody raised their hand because we understand something. Our conscience bear witnesses that we have all fallen short and the payment for our sin, one little sin. I use that word loosely. I'll explain that in, at the end of the sermon as well. But the payment for sin is death. Death. But the gift, which is totally different, the gift you had nothing to do with, yeah, you earned your death. We earned our death through our behavior, through our trespass against God. But the gift that God freely gives is everlasting life. And where is it found? It's found in Jesus our Lord. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. So we need to ask ourselves, if the payment for sin is death, what, what is death? Ever ask yourself this? This is something we need to understand. What is death? What happens to a person who dies without Jesus? You close your eyes and you open them in eternity. You take your last breath. What does that look like for you if you do not know Christ? Is there a literal hell? And if so, if there is a literal hell, is, is, it, is it temporary? Is it permanent? Is there a way out? Does the Bible teach a purgatory? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, cheated, kind of gave that answer. Did Jesus mention hell? It's important. See, the Bible gives us a clear warning concerning the truth of eternity. I was doing some research for this script for this sermon, and, and I went to I saw a question on Billy Graham's website. And you know, people, you know, it's like I forget Dr. Laura or somebody. You now people sending questions and they answer them in a public forum. Well, sometimes we'll ask a question to create an opportunity to share our opinion. And that's kind of what happens here. But I want you to listen to the question. The question was this. Did Jesus ever say anything about hell? I don't believe in hell myself. I believe God is a God of love and wouldn't send anyone to hell. Does that sound familiar? Maybe you believe that. I think preachers who talk about hell all the time are just trying to scare people into believing in their religion. So... Forget the, the premise and the accusation, and that may be. I've heard preachers, I'm either going to scare you out of hell or scale, scare the hell out of you, either one way, you know. <laughs> That's not my intention today. However, no. <laughs> so the question was, did Jesus ever say anything about hell? Fortunately, yes. Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible and almost as much as everybody else in the Bible, Old Testament and New but the Bible teaches very clearly that we are to be saved. I think we hear this. This is not just Christianese. This is not just Christian talk. The Bible clearly says we must be saved. Therefore, if we must be saved, there must be something that we should... I remember going uh, on a trip with a, with a gentleman, and this gentleman would walk up to people just kind of arbitrarily. And he's got an evangelistic heart, and he would say, Hey, are you saved? And these people would go, What? It was kind of comical. And then they would go, what would, your, what would be your response? Somebody walks up and goes, are you saved? You would go, are you a terrorist? Do I need to be saved? Am I saved from what? And then, of course, he would use that as a caveat to tell them about their need to be saved so he could share the gospel. Hey, look, whatever works, I'm not going to knock somebody's tools. And just remember, if you need to be saved, this is the implication that you are in jeopardy of some sort. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 9, it says, I am the door, and anyone who enters through me will be saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. Mark 16, 6, or 16, 16 says, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Got it? You kind of see the theme. And he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Ephesians 2 and 8 through 9 says this. And this is a good one. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this verse. God saved you, saved you through faith as an act of His kindness. You had nothing to do with it. Being saved is a gift from God. And it's not the result of anything you've done, so don't go brag about it. Wow, that's, that's pretty plain. 
Acts 2.21 says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, I'm going to share a lot of scriptures today, and they're not going to be coming up or whatever, so write a lot of them down. I am going to have a lot come up, but jot these down. Safe from what? Jesus said it this way. Do not be afraid of those, and this is in Matthew 10, 28. Do not be, check out what I'm saying, please. Matthew 10, 28, after the service, Ryan. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is Jesus talking. So yes, Jesus talked about hell. The Bible constantly talks about the need to be saved from hell. Now, I know that it's not popular to talk about hell. Oh, you can't talk about hell, Pastor Tommy. Okay, well, people get upset, and it's like, okay, it's like this. It's like, you tell me to stay out of the street, but I can't tell you why. You don't do that. It's like, boy, get out of the street before you get ran over by a car. <gasps> Did I say Car? You see, so it's like, you, you Christians can't talk about hell because if you do, you're just trying to scare somebody. Yeah, I want my kids to know if they play in the street, they're going to get ran over by a car, and it's going to be ugly. It's the same concept. We need to understand <laughs> that it could be bad. And let me tell you why. Let me give you a very practical application. How many heard of Aaron Rodgers? It's, it's, it's kickoff, right? You know, y'all know Green Bay Packers? Well, something happened recently. Aaron Rodgers had been hanging around or had been influenced heavily, and the entire team, in fact, had been influenced heavily by a particular preacher. Listen, I'm not going to mention names because I'm not into preacher bashing. However, I will address heresy. So God's, I'm, who am I to judge another man's servant? I, I don't do that. But I tell you what, I will address some foolishness when it's taught. Needless to say, he hung around this person, and this pastor had such an incredible, profound influence on him that he adopted his perspective and come out three days ago and declared that he, like the pastor, does not believe in a literal hell. Now, here, here's the deal. He has been influenced, and he has influence. It really matters. It really does make a difference if there's a, if there's a hell or not. Because if there's no hell, then we question the validity of the entirety of the Scriptures. Not only that, there's a lot of different ramifications. 2 Timothy, and here's the, here's the reason I mention this, because 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 tells us this very, very clearly. It says, a time will come when people will not listen to accurate teaching. I came here today to fight. I came here to fight for souls and for minds. I'm not fighting against people. But I understand a time will come when people will not listen to accurate teaching. Instead, they will follow their own desires, understand the implication, your own desires are contrary to the teaching of the Word by nature. This is a hint of the, of the state of humanity. Instead, they will follow their own desires and surround themselves with teachers who tell them what they want to hear. Look, I understand. When you're on Facebook, you want everybody to agree with you. You want everybody to affirm your opinion. But I'm going to tell you something. There's something better than my feelings. It's called truth, and I, I just want the truth. And I think we need to know the truth. Now, I need you to listen very clearly about what I'm going to say over the next few minutes. And don't you, because if you don't listen to what I'm about to say right now, you're going to go out of here and you're going to lie on me and God's going to get you. I'm telling you, God's going to get you. <laughs> I forgive you. But I just, I really want you to understand what I'm about to say. I'm about to address an issue. Don't mess this up. When you flip over that sheet with the notes on it, there are some statements. Those are not doctrinal statements from Rockfish Church. So don't walk out of here and go, well, Rockfish Church. Everybody's looking at the back. This is not Rockfish Church's stance. I am addressing this article and the assertions made in an article by a popular progressive Christian. Okay? When you hear the word progressive Christian, the hair on the back of your neck should stand up. I'm just going to tell you that's a red flag. A progressive Christian is like a progressive constitutionalist. We believe that culture dictates truth. Culture dictates original intent, and it changes. Listen, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says so. He said so. Therefore, we're not going to deviate and say something he didn't say or say he said it then, but he didn't mean it now and, and that kind of stuff, okay? So we're just going to do that. But I'm addressing this because this is a very popular pro progression, uh, progressive Christian and, and I'm not going to say his name again, but he, understand, he is a Christian contributor to Time Magazine, to Sojourners, to Red Letter, Red Letter Christian, to Christian Weekly, to the Mennonite World Review, to the Good Men Project. This author has also been featured as guest on the HuffPost Live, the Drew Marshall Show, up for debate, and has been <clears throat> a repeat guest on Tell Me Everything with John Fugel saying, this man influences thousands, if not millions, in his writings. Listen to me. 
Oprah is not a theologian. This man has influenced her directly. You better know what you're hearing. Listen, people. People... People will pull on your heartstrings and your emotions. They will change words and they will manipulate you because they know how strong your feelings are. You've got to be careful. Now, there's five reasons I'm going to do this. Number one, I want to teach you the importance of knowing the word. Number two, it leads right into that, is so that you'll recognize heresy. We need to understand it. We need to recognize it. Number three, I want you to understand, and I believe this really epitomizes the arrogance and the pride of humanity towards Almighty God. Understand the nature of humanity, which we're all prone to. Don't fool yourself. Don't think you're not. Number four, and recognize, and this is the most important. I'm going to go through this and show this so that you will recognize the value of the gospel that we share, of the gospel that we preach. It is the power of God to save people from said deception. It's the power, is the hope of God for this world. All right, you ready? Again, this is not, I've just been afraid somebody's going to tune in right now and hear this and say, well, this is what they teach. Don't mess this up. Five reasons is the name of the article. Five reasons why more Christians are rejecting the traditional view of hell. I'm going to give the statement, then I'm going to give his argument, and then I'm going to share his accusations, and then we're going to look at the word. This is the way it works. Sounds really good. Something in our spirit tells us that torturing people is morally wrong. Now, something that's happened here is they substituted the word torture for punishment so they could get an emotional response. I'm telling you, you got to watch it. Is it unjust for someone to go to jail for their crime? Is that torture? It's punishment. It's something due to them. It's a result of justice. Anyway, something in our spirit, and this is why it's important to test the spirits. When something in your spirit tells you something contrary to the word of God, it's the wrong spirit. You understand? The argument is this, and this is his quote, not mine. The assertion that God himself would not only torture people but take great pleasure in it is something that many of us in Christianity are finding utterly offensive. Oh, that's strong language, isn't it? How God is, if he is that way, is offensive to me as a Christian. He's setting this up, and you're going to see the theme and see how it works out. But here's the accusation. If there is a hell, God must be a cruel sadist, number one. Number two, the idea of hell is offensive if you are a real Christian. If you're not, you're just not spiritual. If, if hell is offensive, if not offensive to you, it's because you're not walking in love. Hang on. Number three, if there is a hell, God must take pleasure in putting people there. Okay, thank you, Jesus, for sending your word. Let me show you the heart of God. Let me show you the point of this. And we're going to really dig in more. But Ezekiel 18, 23. You might want to write this one down. This is God talking. He says, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? See, some people have the idea, and you may even be a believer, that God is holding you over hell waiting to cut your thread and drop you in there. Let's see what God's attitude, according to his word and his statement. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Question mark declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? It's the heart of God. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. I'm going to show you later. God, if you're in hell, you're a trespasser. If a man goes to hell, he's a trespasser against the will and the design and the creation of Almighty God. The idea that people should pay for their sins and crimes is not repulsive to me. I call myself proudly and boldly and unapologetically a Christian. I think it's it's called justice. It's called logic. And there's some things that we don't understand in the pride of humanity. Accusations that we will make against God in our ignorance. Like this gentleman has done. Number two is second reason why more Christians are rejecting the traditional view of hell is the concept of eternal conscious torment runs contrary to the whole testimony of Scripture. Really? This guy has more degrees than a thermometer. He is a theologian. Learned. He's been on Oprah. They will gather to themselves people who will tell. All right, anyway. Like, I love Oprah pray and she repents and gets saved. All right, here's the argument. When we look at the entire testimony of Scripture, and this is him, this is his argument, 
We most often see the disposition of those who, uh, who refuse to enter into God's love described as the second death, not as hell. Traditional hell isn't death at all. Traditional hell is instead an eternal life of torture. This simply isn't what the Bible describes when, we, when, we, when taking into account the entire testimony. Okay? All right. Okay. The accusation is this. The Bible doesn't teach a literal hell, but a second death. That is simply ceasing to exist, not torment. Okay, so i gotta, I got to tell you this. The second death is biblical. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. In fact, the second death is mentioned one time. It's mentioned in Revelation 21 and 8. So let's see. So what he's saying is that the Bible really refers to the second death of man, really, if you look at it holistically, rather than hell, that place of torment that we've traditionally been taught and see described by Jesus and everybody else in the Bible. So let's see if that's true. So I went straight over and let's use his own terminology, his own reference, and let's see what this second death looks like and see if it looks like not existing or see if it looks kind of like traditional hell. Anyway, Revelation 20. Did he think people weren't going to read their Bible? I guess he must have assumed that. Revelation 21.8 mentions the second death. And you tell me what you think about this second death. But cowardly, unfaithful, ooh, Detestable people, murderers, sexual sinners. Listen to me, sexual sin. I don't care what form it takes. Sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars will find themselves in the lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Oh, that's much better than the hell we've been taught. What? The Bible says that at one point, death and hell and all those who have, who have aligned themselves with the kingdom head, Satan, will be cast into the lake of fire. That is the second death. Oh, that's much better than hell? Really? It's just, a guy, people are depending on you, defaulting to your emotions and your feelings and to human logic, which is fallen and broken, rather than trusting the word of God. And I'm going to give you good reasons why this can happen. I understand this. It's just wrong. Anyway, how about this one? The final judgment of each individual is Jesus. And torturing people just seems contrary to his character. Again, you see the word that has been, that has been shifted. Punishing, torment. Yeah, it will be, to, it will be torment. Argument. This is, a, this is not my statement. I'm quoting him. And this is his argument after he gives us making that statement. The idea that the end result of rejecting God's love will be a slow, roasting, eternal torture session with Jesus at the controls is almost asinine. Sounds good. Very compelling. He's a wordsmith. This is not the Jesus we find in the New Testament. Really? So here's the accusation. One, if God requires justice and executes judgment, he is somehow a sadist devoid of compassion and cruel. This is the accusation. I'm better than him if he requires this. Whew, we're going to see that arrogance. He's actually going to, I don't want to give it away. Number two, dealing with the wicked is contrary to Jesus' character. Well, let's see what Jesus said because Jesus does something very incredible. And I want you to see this. Here's the picture of where we're going to take up. Jesus was, was sharing a, a parable with his people. And he says, I want you to, I'm, I'm going to give you a peek into what the final judgment is. He said, on that day, everybody great and small, is going to be brought before the throne and they're going to be divided into two sections. Is your name in the book? Is your name not in the book? On the right will be the sheep. On the left will be what he refers to as goats. This is his address at that moment. He showed us what's going to happen in history. You and I will be standing there when this occurs. You're going to look over at Pastor Tony and go, well, you said it. What are you doing over there? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Lord, help me. All right, Matthew 25, 41 through 36 says this. Then he will say to those on his left. Don't read into that. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you understand right there? Every accusation. Every accusation. Hell was never meant for humanity. In the original design, in the original creation, it was never meant for man. If you go to hell, you're trespassing. It's because you have assigned and dedicated and committed your allegiance to the, to, to the one who trespassed against God. And God is saying, I've made a better way. Come into my kingdom through translation and transformation. If you go to hell, you are trespassing. It was created for Satan and his angels. 
He said, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. You did nothing that love compels one to do. They were completely void of the one characteristic of the believer. The one characteristic of the man or woman who has the Spirit of God. God is love. They will know you by your love for one another. Every one of these is a withholding of compassion and love because of it inca- incapable of doing so. He said this, They also will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry and thirsty and a stranger and needing clothes or sick in prison and didn't help you? And he will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for the least of one of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So you see the the difference. Five reasons why more Christians are rejecting the traditional view of hell. Jesus would become, you've got to follow me on this one. Jesus would be a hypocrite or would become a hypocrite demanding that we nonviolently love our enemies while he does the complete opposite. And here's his argument. It's pretty compelling. If Jesus commands that we should love our enemies, refuse to use violence, and that we actually do good to those who hate us, yet eternally tortures his enemies, he's guilty of hypocrisy. The accusations. You're about to reach a boiling point. You're about to see what's behind all of this. And this is the danger. The assertion is this, that hell is inconsistent with the character of God. Uh, let me explain something to you. Thank God for the Bible so we can understand this. Listen, we are called to defer to righteous judgment just as Jesus did. It is. He does say, do not return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. He does say, bless and do not curse. He does say, turn the other cheek. He does say, Pray for your enemies and those who spitefully use you. Not with the idea that they're going to get away scot-free. Listen to this. 1 Peter 2, 23. This is our high priest. This is the example. Christ never verbally abused those who verbally abused him. When he suffered, he did not make any threats. Listen, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. But left everything to the one who judges Fairly. Jesus did not omit or overlook injustice. He deferred justice and the penalty due to the Father. Jesus said it. I could call 10,000 angels to take me off this cross and smush you like bugs. But I'm deferring to a just Father. I'm entrusting my, myself to God who I know judges justly. And I'm demonstrating the love and the patience and the forbearance of God. And don't mistake it. Don't mistake his mercy and his patience with you as overlooking his righteousness and his holiness because it's not. Don't be confused. We defer God's judgment for two reasons. One, we trust his righteousness. Number two, we want to demonstrate God's mercy to them while there is still hope. Listen to me, I want to be honest with you. If, if you. if you're here and you're a believer, I will judge you. Well, judge, stop. Listen to me, judge. Oh, hush. Go get your context. We're to judge one another righteously if you're a believer. We're we're going to judge angels. I do not judge people outside. I do not pass judgment on them because I'm reaching for them because judgment has already been passed on those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? What you tell them and what you don't tell them has nothing to do with their current position. If you are not in the kingdom of God and one of God's children, you are in the kingdom of Satan and it is destined for destruction. You can die along with him, but the gospel beckons you to get off that path. To get out of the way of that hurricane. If you do not do so, you do do, do it to your own detriment. But if you're not a believer, I, I got no judgment for you. I'm just here to tell you some really, really good news. Really good news. Some most valuable news you will ever hear as long as you ever live. Last point. Five reasons why more Christians are rejecting the traditional view of hell. These are not the reasons. I can give you a reason. One, lack of knowing the word. Two, lack of not having the spirit. Three, a bunch of pastors tell them a bunch of junk. But I'm, uh, Let me get back here. We simply cannot... Oh, this is good. We simply cannot get past the idea that we are more gracious and more merciful than Jesus himself. Oh, do you hear it? Do you hear it? Listen, listen to this. And here's the accusation. I, let me back up. 
The accusation is this. I am superior to, to a God that would require a penalty for sin. Oh, really? It's easy to understand why this gentleman and so many others miss it. It's not a matter of being more compassionate. It's not a matter of being more merciful. It's a matter of being much less righteous and much less holy. Do you understand? See, when you get God, you don't just get, you don't just get baby Jesus, Talladega Nights. Jesus, you understand? You don't just get, well, God loves every. You don't just get the God of love because God is love, but he has some other very powerful attributes. One of them is righteousness. The other one is holiness. Holiness is the standard that determines the righteousness and the love, the pureness of that love, in fact. Something called the full counsel of God. Listen, there's some good news. There's some bad news. We need to know. We need to be sure. We need to understand fully. There are three attributes, again, that are revealed. One, the love of God, the righteousness of God, and the holiness of God, and they are inseparable. The grace of God and the mercy of God not only applies to the offender, it also applies to the victim. You understand that God says in his word he deems it a righteous thing to put tribulation on those who torment you. It's in there. I'm not going to tell you where. Google it. How about this? Let me show you what the love of God looks like. The love of God is sacrificial. The righteousness of God requires justice. Justice according to what? Justice according to the holiness of God, which is a standard and a perspective. This is where we lose it. See, we're broken. And even the guy writing this article doesn't understand. Because we were birthed into a world that's broken and our perspective is broken and our hearts are dark. And by nature, if we could get our hands around God to relieve ourselves from the accountability of God in our broken state, we would. God in his mercy extended his throat and said, go ahead and choke it. And by doing so, you will open the availability to the greatest gift heaven has to offer. And mankind, under the inspiration of Satan, did just that. And in doing so, made something beautiful available to us. You see, our lack of love changes our definition of love from sacrificial to tolerant. Let me explain something to you. The love of God is not, salv is not synonymous with the salvation of God. God so loved the world. That is, the that is it. The condition is this, that whosoever... You say, well, God loves me. I'm not, no, 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 no. It's not the love of God that sends a person to heaven. It's the love of God that draws them to the place of righteousness, which is only available in Jesus. Do you understand? The simplicity and the beauty and the power. But we twist love because we're twisted by nature. Our lack of righteousness blinds us to the necessity of justice. And this is probably the most profound one. Our lack of holiness blinds us from seeing just how horrible and destructive sin is. Guys, here's the truth. We've been boiled. We were born into a broken world. We were born into a world of chaos that wasn't designed this way from the beginning. Man was never made to go to hell. Man was never made to die. But God understands just how egregious sin is. We look and go, oh, it's just a little sin. It's because we are so unholy. To a holy God, he recognizes this fact. One sin committed by Adam opened the floodgates and sin come in and distorted all of creation. From the center of the earth to the, to the uttermost reaches of the universe, it was broken in that moment because of one sin. You can't weep at it when you are a holy God. It opened the door and every single man, woman, and child born is appointed to them once to die because of that sin. He understands the implication of what would happen if he released a creature made in his image into eternity. Why do you think when Adam sinned, God said, put an angel in front of that tree because if that rascal gets back there, it's going to live forever. And we cannot unleash something like that onto eternity. Death became that point where man became accountable to judgment to decide if he would be confined in hell. Otherwise, he would have destroyed not only what is seen, but he would wreak havoc on what was invisible. Sin is not something that's little and small. In our culture, we look at it and we wink. Oh, that's just sin. Everybody does it. All right, I'm going to back off. Here's a, here's a problem. In our pride and our arrogance and our deception, we recreate God into our image. He's not like us. We seek to tame and control him rather than to surrender and lay down our arms like good terrorists. 
So now let's look back at our original statement. And here's, here's the beauty of the point. Heaven's treasure. Oh, heaven's treasure. It's translation through transformation. I want you to consider right now everything I've told you, but now let's, let's shift. I want you to catch this. Consider the length to which God went to rescue man from the righteous penalty due him. Consider the length that God has gone through himself personally on our behalf to translate us from the kingdom of darkness where we are captives, willing captives into the kingdom of the son of his love. Think about this. He left heaven and was found in the fashion and the form of a man. He took the form of a man so much lower for the purpose of suffering on our behalf. He warned man clearly of the fate to come. The gospel, again, is heaven's early warning system. It's like there's people in Florida. Listen to me, guys. You understand, this is so real. We've got a hurricane bearing down, but people have been saying, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. The gospel says, get off the road that is a road of destruction. Get off Satan's team. We need to depopulate hell and the kingdom of hell and populate. He's saying, please, get off this road. The hurricane is coming. And Jesus is the evacuation route. Do you understand? And he says this over. This is the gospel. He paid the penalty for man's trespass as egregious as it was. All of it was poured out. All of the penalty satisfied a holy God through his body, his blood, made possible the way of escape by his very own blood. Yet even in the face of this kind of love, some will reject him and accuse him. So you've got to understand the gospel. You've got to understand the value of the gospel and the power of this truth. The gospel given by the church as we go and take that gospel is the hope for all humanity. If we seal our mouths, we do it to the destruction. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. The good news is you were never meant to go to hell. The good news is God has made a full provision for you to come to heaven. You say, how do you do that, Pastor Tony? What does that look like? Let me read you this. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repent. Listen to me. I have four babies. I have four children. I would stand between heaven and earth and beg Christ not to come back if I knew those children didn't know Him. If I knew that his return would seal their fate and it was anything other than heaven, I would, if, if I in my broken state and so, am so compelled to reach for my children, to intercede for my children, can you imagine the passion and the compassion of God Almighty on our behalfs? That I care about my children as a residual. And some of you have children. Maybe some of you are children. There's nothing you want more than to see those children saved. I'm telling you. That is the gospel. Not only that they can be, but the provision has already been. Matthew 13, 45 and 46 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, eternal significance, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Have you, will you accept the most valuable of all of heaven's treasures? It's a question. This gospel is for you and for me and for this moment. Listen to this. Peter replied, you say, how do I do this, Pastor Tony? Is this, hey, can you help me understand? How, how, do, how do I go? How does translation through transformation, what does that look like? Listen to this. This is why we do what we do. This is why you saw people in the tank. This is why at the moment in the spirit, if you could rip it open and look, angels were rejoicing as those people were going under the water. All of heaven is partying. Somebody heard you, you mean to tell me that one soul is worth shutting down all of heaven and getting a jig on? Oh, yeah. We don't know how valuable we are. Don't ever underestimate what you are and in whose image you have been made. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name. 
for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the transformation. When you by faith believe God does his part, moves on the broken, unregenerated, dead heart and puts life in its place by the power of his spirit. He goes on to say this and I'm so glad he added this. This gives me hope. The promise is for you right here, right now. The promise is for you and your children. And I breathe a sigh and go, oh, thank you. And for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Listen, I'm not going to get all weepy voiced and I'm not going to drag this out, but I'm going to tell you right now, the spirit of no man comes to the Father except by the Spirit except by the Son, and no man comes to the Son except by the Spirit of God, unless the Spirit of God draw him. The Spirit of God will not always strive, will not always draw men. I'm telling you, if the Spirit of God has moved upon you, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, if the Father is calling you home, know the blood of Jesus is the way, and I am begging you, I am begging you, answer the call of eternity. If you've walked away and you're living as a prodigal in a foreign land, I'm telling you, get out. Return home. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you do not know, all who call with a pure heart, with, a, with all their heart on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen, I know we baptize. We'll open that rascal up and, and baptize you right now. If the Spirit of God is drawing you, I beseech you. Prayer partners, come up and we're going to pray. Prayer partners, if y'all could come up. Listen, if you need prayer... I'm just, I'm just asking you, as if I were your father and you were my child, and I'm not even going to take that, I'm just telling you, please, I tell my own children, please, do not harden your heart in the day of his calling. Stand if you're able. We'll get out of here. If you do not know today that if you died, you would spend eternity in heaven and be in the presence of the Lord, you can know that today. And I invite you to come and we'll pray with you. God's arms are open. Today is the day of salvation. His blood has made the way. You say, well, I'm not perfect, Pastor Tony. I got a bunch of junk in my life. Listen, if you could do it, <laughs> he wouldn't have had to do it anyway. We do everything we do by faith. In the face of our brokenness, we look to Jesus and say, God, give me your righteousness because I know I'm not. And outside of you, I will never be. Help me, Jesus. That's all a person needs to do is cry out. If you do not know him and you want to know him, there are people here who will pray, pray with you. If you know him and you've walked away and been living as that prodigal, we will pray with you, okay? Father, I thank you, Lord that you've made your gospel available to us. God, I ask you to give the church the grace to share that gospel boldly and clearly like never before. God, I ask you for revival. God, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but God, waken us, awaken us, pour out your spirit upon us like you prophesied that you would. God, restore us and draw us. Father, depopulate hell. Let its gates not stand as we begin to assault it through prayer and the sharing of the gospel like never before. Father, send revival to this world. Draw us, God, to you. And Daddy, thank you so much for heaven's greatest gift, Jesus Christ. Amen.